Hello and welcome to this film featuring images taken of events around Cornwall from 1939 up to 1963. We have three sections featuring during the war, rest and play and food and farming. There's no rush at all. Do stop the film at any time to have a chat with your companions and share your memories. Then when you're ready, just press play and carry on. Most of the images featured in this film are from the fabulous George Ellis Photographic Archive held at Cresson Curnow, Cornwall's Archive Centre. George Ellis was a press photographer and took over 100,000 images in his long career. His archive is now cared for at Cresson Curnow, which is situated on the former Redruth Brewery site and is home to 1.5 million documents, books and photographs, covering over 850 years of Cornwall's history. This image shows George Ellis himself holding up one of the glass plate negatives to have a closer look at it. Behind him you can see the row upon row of cardboard boxes which would house the glass plate negatives 12 to a box. In the next image you can see the wonderful storage facilities at Cresson Curnow and you see aisle upon aisle and shelf upon shelf uh, housing the glass plate negatives in their boxes. Now here we have an image of Bob Hope uh, coming to uh, entertain the US troops at Bodmin on the 15th of July 1943 and he came to their barracks and you can see um, that in spite of the torrential rain he uh, obviously kept the troops um, chuckling away. Uh, now, Bob Hope was an Anglo-American. He was born in, in the UK and then his family went to the States. And he was a very famous um, comedian, actor. He uh, acted in lots of films with um, Bing Crosby, didn't he? And a, a very good dancer as well. Now, between 1941 and 1991, he made 57 tours um, for the United Service Organization to uh, entertain active military personnel overseas. Now, of that 50 years, he spent 48 Christmases overseas. He used to say it saved him a fortune in Christmas presents. But he would make these uh, shows a special um, time of delight for people. He um, toured in uh, Korea, Vietnam, Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, the Persian Gulf. And when he was making his visits, he would also visit hospital wards as well. Uh, now, there, his part of his show would be that there would be song and dance, comedy, um, and he would also have some uh, attractive ladies on stage with him. And uh, it, there's an example that in a Far Eastern tour in 1957, the actress um, Jane Mansfield was with him. And I'm quoting here, and he said, I reminded the boys that Jane was wearing a special dress for the occasion made of 200 yards of barbed wire. <laughs> I think from that he meant that they weren't going to get anywhere near um, her, didn't he? Now, um, this picture we've got is quite a close-up. Uh, whether George Ellis, the photographer, was actually on the stage in the corner, I don't know. But um, Ellis actually had permission to go on to military bases um, as a, sort of a press photographer. So uh, we can see that the chaps, although they're totally soaked, they are absolutely with Bob waiting for uh, the next uh, joke. A lot of his humour was actually um, taking the mickey out of himself, wasn't it? Um, and that was really appealing um, to people. I wonder if you like the humour of um, Bob Hope and um, Bing Crosby in the films or whether you ever um, saw any of his shows on the television.
Here we have a cheerful girl smiling back at the camera. Uh, we have uh, this image of a young lady taken on Porthpian Beach in 1939. And you can see she's wearing her woolen swimsuit. Uh, and I think that's probably a towel over her shoulder, but it looks a bit more like a tablecloth. But uh, I expect it's a towel. And then across her body, she's got her gas mask. Now, um, this gas mask in its box looks brand new. And I read that in by uh, September 1939, there had been 38 million gas masks issued um, to men, women and children. And uh, we can see um, that uh, she's going to hopefully go swimming. Um, she's very suntanned. You can tell she's used to coming to the beach. And I hope that swimsuit doesn't sag too alarmingly once uh, she goes in for a dip. Uh, those woolen ones, I think, got um, very heavy and certainly um, dragged down a bit. So uh, I think maybe when she gets home, perhaps her mum could put in another buttonhole or two. Uh, but I wonder if you had one of those costumes uh, made of wool. This one looks to have been homemade, um, but there were uh, ones made of uh, sort of fine wool that were um, commercially available. Uh, did you have any bother with them or were they uh, comfy and cosy? I expect they were comfy and cosy when they were dry, but soggy and chilly once they'd got wet. This is a very jolly band of school children leaving school in Bodmin in the early weeks of the war. Uh, they seem unconcerned by carrying their gas masks with them uh, where they go. And uh, in fact, you can see uh, the gas mask boxes are still in uh, fine condition. I do understand that actually as the war went on, the boxes could become more battered as they were only made of cardboard. And people often resorted to finding another more sturdy box to put the mask in. This is a very cheerful picture, isn't it? We've got six little scallywags um, aloft on that pony there um, being held by Mr Bunt at the old Cardinum Sheep Market in August 1940. Uh, those children were evacuees and I should think they'd never seen a pony before, let alone being six um, all on top at the same time. Uh, they're obviously grinning from ear to ear and the little ones are being sort of squashed in between the big ones so that they won't uh, fall off. I wonder if they had a good walk round um, or whether the pony actually had a little trot. I'm sure they'd wobble off, wouldn't they? But you can see they're having a, a really jolly day. So I'm sure they're being looked after uh, very carefully by um, the families that had them to stay. I wonder if you had any experiences of evacuees um, living with your family um, or if you've got any stories about that. Um, do chat with your companions. I'm sure you'll have many tales to tell. British Army transport companies had been disbanded prior to the start of World War II. However, it was thought that mules would be useful in France to take supplies to the front when roads had become impassable. Four companies of Royal Indian Army Service Corps soldiers and their mules were sent from India to France. 2,700 mules were shipped from Bombay to Marseille without any animal losses on the way. The mules had been devoiced by vets before so that they could not bray and thus reveal their position when in battle. The corps were extremely supportive to the operations in France across that most severe winter for 125 years. Then came the retreat of forces to Dunkirk and the soldiers were extremely distressed as they couldn't take their mules with them. They gave them to locals in the northern France. Once back in England, they came briefly to Cornwall for three months, which is where these pictures come from. Here's a picture of the uh, Indian officers on horseback and uh, followed by the 
soldiers with their mules. Uh, the mules were either um, destined to carry packs or uh, two mules uh, would pull a light cart. That was how they were deployed. Here is a picture of uh, the soldiers exercising uh, their mule trains. They used the old cinema in St Austell as stables and George Ellis, the photographer, recollects seeing the mules being led out of the old exit doors. That would give you a shock if you weren't expecting it, wouldn't it? We've got a great celebration going on here. Uh, it, it took place in Bodmin in August 1945 and it was a VJ party. So a victory over Japan party. And you can see we've got a lot of people packed into that room. Maybe it's a village hall. I should think it is from the look of the stained glass window there. And we've got children uh, sitting there all around the tables and uh, lots of food uh, there to be tucked into in a little while. And we've got the lady helpers and a lot of mums there with babies in their arms. So everybody looks in very fine spirits. I wonder if you've been to big celebration parties at all, whether it was the coronation or uh, jubilee parties or street parties. Um, do have a chat about it with your pals. I'm sure you've all had um, different experiences. This is an absolute howl here, isn't it? Look, we've got these lads, um, evac evacuees again, having a wheelbarrow race at Wadebridge School in August 1940. Uh, look at the ones at the front on the right. I think there's a calamity about to happen, isn't there? Because we've got a big tangling of legs going on, even though they were at the front of the race. And then we've got those bigger lads um, grinning away as they're uh, propelling their uh, wheelbarrows forward. But it looks like um, they're really entering into the spirit of uh, these games. And let's hope they're having a, a really grand afternoon. Seems to be all boys from what I can see. I don't see any girls there. Maybe um, they've got different activities going on. Perhaps they're somewhere else on the field doing a three-legged race, maybe. This is a fun picture, isn't it? Uh, we've got some youngsters here at St Austell Feast Day in 1941. So here they're all gathered in the field. Uh, maybe there have been lots of games happening. Um, perhaps they uh, processed from uh, the Sunday school maybe with uh, behind a band with a big banner um, held aloft. And so uh, they've ended up uh, coming along to a nearby field to have their uh, saffron bun, their tea treat bun and maybe a bottle of Jolly's Pop. And that's the one that they would have in Cornwall. Or perhaps they would have some sugary tea given to them out of great big teapots. But we've got a mixed reaction, haven't we, to these uh, saffron buns, which are like a regular uh, saffron bun, only I think these are made uh, to last a bit longer and stay fresher a while uh, longer. So they've got a bit more fat in them and a bit less yeast. Uh, so that in terms of numbers for these feast days, uh, there would be huge numbers, hundreds of these buns would be made. So we've got a mixed reaction here, the little lad or the little uh, toddler um, on the right there with the older lady. I don't know if they're going to sink their little teeth into that bun or just carry it round for a while. Um, the girlie with the bonnet on, she's clearly really disappointed. Uh, probably she's been looking forward to that bun and uh, then she finds she doesn't like the a slightly bitter taste of the saffron. Uh, the lad next to her, he's tucking in, he's quite happy, um, as are some of the other children. 
and then we've got another toddler there in their push chair i think they're probably going to just hang on to their bun don't you think um and uh, uh, wait till they get home but it looks like they still look pretty clean and tidy these children i don't think they've had too many uh, riotous games yet um, but they look like they've had a good time don't they This picture is of the Bugle Band Contest in 1963. Bugle is a village in the clay country in mid-Cornwall. And in 1912, the village decided to hold a single event as a fundraiser for the Working Men's Institute in Bugle. At the time, there were more than a dozen bands in the surrounding villages and so they knew they would have a good attendance. And in fact, 6,000 people came along to that very first event. It was so successful, it was agreed that they would carry it on as an annual event. And that's what they've done to this day, apart from breaks for World Wars I and II and the more recent coronavirus. Here we have uh, bands marching uh, along the path there and in front we've got some chaps carrying some fine silverware there, some fine cups aloft. And I'd like to draw your attention to that second cup from the left that the chap with the cap and the light coloured jacket is holding. That is the Royal Trophy for the Championship Section Winners, which was given to the festival by the late Duke of Windsor, then Prince of Wales and Duke of Cornwall in 1913. Part of the event is that the bands actually march from the village centre these days to the concert grounds at the beginning of the day and then at the end of the day they march back. Tawan Beach in Newquay on the 13th of May 1940 and here we've got right in the front of our picture we've got a lovely strong horse pulling a trolley full of deck chairs down onto the beach to be hired out um, for the day. Quite a few people have got deck chairs already haven't they whether they brought them with them or hired them um, from the chap with his horse I'm not sure. We've got two kiosks in front of us as well, and they seem to be both owned by the Staffieri Company, noted for superior ices made under hygienic conditions. So that's lovely Italian ice cream, isn't it? And they've got confectionery, cigarettes, films and toys for sale. I notice on the base of those kiosks we've got some wooden wheels. I don't know if they have to pull those um, kiosks up uh, the beach or up the, the ramp every day. Maybe it's just when they have high tides they've got to get them out of the way of the advancing water. You see people are settled on the beach, the tide is out and we've got um, people pointing in all sorts of different directions, some pointing up the beach, some pointing uh, down to sea. I notice some little uh, sheds to the bottom on the right there. I wonder if they were a be a beach huts. I never had a beach hut. Um, I wonder if you did. They, people seem to hire them for, for the whole summer, I think, and then they could keep all their equipment inside and then uh, just put the padlock on um, at the end of the day and go home without having to uh, haul all their bits and bobs back up that ramp and back to the car uh, or the bus, depends how they got there. But um, interesting to have this lovely sunny day with everybody um, sat on the beach there. I wonder if you were a beachgoer when you were young. Did you go with your family? Were you carrying lots of uh, bits and pieces like your towel uh, with your costume wrapped in it and um, maybe a bucket and spade or perhaps you helped carry some of the picnic as well. We always seemed to go packed up, didn't we, for the day with flasks and sandwiches and cake um, and uh, maybe some pop for the uh, children. 
maybe going to the beach was a bit of an unusual event for you. Perhaps you didn't live near the coast and so to go to the beach was either a special uh, day when you went in a coach or a charabang to the beach for an event or perhaps you went on a holiday and then stayed at the seaside for a week or so. Some people over the years I've spoken to them and they've been farmers and they said no in the summertime visits to the beach were never on the cards because there was so much work to do on the farm. So they were working um, from uh, sunrise to sunset getting all the jobs done so the seaside had to wait. Talk chat to your pals about your experiences. This looks like uh, these youngsters are having an absolute blast having their pony ride on the beach, don't they? Uh, I think this picture is just great, don't you? I love the super glamorous uh, young lady there who is leading the pony on the left. Um, she's dolled up to the nines, isn't she? She's got her shades on, looking like a super cool uh, young uh, thing. And her um, very up-to-the-minute skirt with its... Uh, I should think that belt is probably elasticated, isn't it? And then her natty blouse... Um, and not quite the outfit for sort of taking ponies up and down the beach. Um, but that youngster um, she's leading is having a, a super time uh, together with that little lad on the uh, slightly bigger pony on the right, who's being led by a um, much older gentleman. Looking at the picture, I'm wondering if he perhaps owned the ponies and the young lady was um, helping him uh, lead people up and down. Uh, this was something uh, I remember myself. I did that um, on the beach in uh, Falmouth in the, in the 1950s and 60s. And this picture is um, the children are on Polzeth Beach in 1959. Uh, but they are having an absolute um, exciting time there. The little girl's abs grinning away. Um, I think she's, she's sort of hanging on for dear life from the look of it. But certainly um, it's a very uh, happy experience she's having. We've got a great image here. Um, it's again on Polzeth Beach in 1959. They seem to have quite a lot going there, don't they? We had the pony rides on the previous image and now we've got the Punch and Judy show. And we've got this chap on stilts. Let's look how big he is compared to those children. Uh, no wonder they're looking absolutely mesmerised. And I think he's advertising the show that's coming along. And it looks to be a Punch and Judy show. And he's Wellington, the ventriloquist. And it threatens a uh, performance. I seem to recall um, when I used to watch these on the beach that after the show, somebody would whip out from behind the booth with a bag. And then you were, um, they would want you to put your threepenny bit in there um, to pay for the show that you'd seen. So we've got some children eagerly awaiting for the event to start and a mum with her uh, toddler there uh, checking it out to see if it'll be suitable. I wonder if Punch and Judy was your thing. Did you see it much as a child, whether it was on the beach or um, in some amusements? Um, it used to worry me rather a lot with the um, crocodile and, and all that bashing about. Um, but uh, some people uh, absolutely love it. I wonder what you felt about it. Wow, this is quite something. Uh, this lady is measuring her giant cucumber, which is almost two foot long. It, it says 23 inches. And I feel sure she's going to put that in for some show, don't you think? Um, I don't know how well it will taste. Do you think it will be super watery? But it certainly is a magnificent 
um, uh, cucumber there. It's balanced on the um, the edge of that um, bed inside her greenhouse, I think. Um, if it was just uh, loose, I think it would have pulled the whole uh, plant down, don't you? But she's clearly extremely proud of um, having uh, kept that uh, going to produce such a uh, magnificent uh, vegetable. I wonder, did you ever grow um, fruit or vegetable for showing um, at county shows or allotment shows? Uh, I wonder if you ever uh, were engaged in that or perhaps you grew things um, just for your own pleasure or to eat. Um, or maybe you're not a grower at all, which is absolutely fine. Um, leave that to, to somebody else and your skills are in a, a different area. We've got a home produce stall here in one of the streets in Bodmin in 1940. And uh, we've got a table groaning with um, fruit, vegetables and maybe some flowers there as well uh, in the distance. And uh, we have a number of ladies um, either bringing produce or having just um, bought some vegetables got a lady with a large marrow in um, the front of our picture and another woman who's got her purse out ready to um, buy something uh, I'm not sure if it's the WI um, or whether uh, it's another organisation. I wonder if you ever were involved with uh, organisations like the WI Here we have an image from the Royal Cornwall Show at Callington in 1950 and we can see a, the stallholder Tippers selling animal medicines. Now there are very many stalls at the uh, show these days and you could spend all day looking around um, and buying virtually everything you could want. Now the show has come to its permanent home in Wadebridge at the county showground from 1960. But before that time, at the time we've got here, uh, the show would alternate between East Cornwall and West Cornwall on um, uh, the different years. Now we can see the grass in front of that stall there and that was fine on a nice sunny day but of course the weather can't be guaranteed and when you've got huge crowds and wet weather uh, that uh, grassy area becomes a sort of mudslide really uh, and people uh, generally take their wellies in case the weather turns uh, against them and they want to be able to uh, keep on moving rather than paddling about in the mud. Here we have uh, a selection of bulls being uh, paraded around the, um, the show ring and uh, their uh, handlers are wearing their white um, coats and it uh, looks to me as they're sort of galloping around at quite a speed there. Um, I wonder how the judging went. But they certainly look as if they mean business, don't they, with the rings in the ends of their noses. I'm not sure if these are young bulls or whether they're a shorter um, mature breed, but uh, certainly they were a bit smaller than I was expecting, but uh, maybe they're just young lads. But uh, certainly they're handsome beasts, aren't they? Here we are in the main show ring at the Royal Cornwall Show, and we've got a number of cattle there um, whether they've had their rosettes awarded and their prizes, I'm not sure yet. But we can see some people uh, watching keenly from uh, the pavilion next to us in the front of the picture. And some cups sitting on the table there to the left. Whether they've uh, just been awarded or whether they're going to be awarded in a minute, I'm not sure. But you can see that this show ring is where they also have the show jumping and that's a, a wonderful uh, part of the, um, the day, watching the horses uh, making their way around the arena and uh, climbing over those uh, ever-increasing uh, jumps. I wonder if you've ever been uh, to these county shows, whether it's in Cornwall or elsewhere, was it something that you liked to do? Uh, perhaps you were competing with animals or whether you were going to uh, 
sell things in a stall or whether you were going as a visitor, which is the way I've been uh, visiting it over the years. Or maybe you haven't been to county shows at all and an agricultural show is uh, not uh, your thing, which is absolutely fine. This is an absolutely lovely image, isn't it, of the children um, bringing their offerings to the um, harvest, a Bodmin harvest at the Church of England School in 1940. And uh, we've got that table absolutely packed with savoy cabbages, beetroots, um, potatoes, grapes, apples, bananas. A banana was a treat then in 1940, wasn't it? And flowers. And then a, a young lady's got a marrow. Somebody else got some carrots and um, a basket of parsnips. Uh, absolutely laden with um, beautiful uh, fruit and vegetables there. I wonder if you remember um, ever uh, sort of taking things to harvest festival services in church or Sunday school uh, or at your school when you were younger um, and then uh, being very proud as you put your produce on the table with um, all the other uh, sort of offerings. I see there's even there's a jar of honey there. I missed that. Um, so uh, it was really a lovely collection. I wonder who was it going to be distributed to at the end. This is an utterly brilliant story about how a farmer resolved the contested ownership of his heifer called Jenny. Now, uh, two farmers in the Boss Castle area were disagreeing about who owned this particular heifer. And it ended up in court and the plaintiff or the person who was bringing the case said to the judge that he could prove that uh, the cow was his by her response to his cowman, Fred Jewell. The judge decided that the best way to sort this out would be to continue the case in a local field where Jenny and a number of the other uh, cows were taken um, for him to look at. And Fred Jewell was um, taken along with the uh, farmer who was contesting the ownership. When the animals were unloaded from the lorry, the judge was checking their sort of ear markings and the hole punch markings and Jenny was taken to a quiet corner of the field. And Fred Jewell, who was wearing his uh, usual cowman's jacket, went up to her and was stroking her neck and, and sort of uh, soothing her and talking uh, in what was reported in the Cornish Guardian in November 1940 as half cow language and half human language, but was unintelligible to anybody who was listening. And then Fred Jewell turned his back on the cow and as the uh, farmer had declared to the judge, her response was to jump up and put her hooves on his shoulders, which is something she'd been doing since she was a calf. The judge felt that there was no doubt um, as to who was the rightful owner of Jenny and he gave the judgment that she should be returned to um, the original plaintiff. He also uh, was reported as saying that Jenny was not on oath but she appeared to think she was and she gave her evidence in a manner as eloquent as any human witness I have ever seen in the witness box. I accept Jenny's evidence. That's a happy ending if ever I heard one. We do hope you've enjoyed watching this film and if you haven't had a chance already do head over and watch film one out of this series. That film includes images showing showtime, dramatic events, the world of sport and royal families. See you again soon. Bye.